Share this whole page. great man it, even in the midst of you know a tragedy the late great miss miss tina turner passing away that was kind of heavy you yeah, know I mean? yeah that was heavy. but but it makes me feel good being black seeing how we come together you know what i mean to celebrate the greats yeah i mean i ask me this man why does it take tragedy to bring us together i don't know i i find myself asking the same thing you know what i mean uh, i think we can get better too at giving people their flowers while they're still alive yeah good morning good morning good morning adrian i'm gonna, I'm gonna get my glasses y'all know sometimes i gotta get the old man i don't look old until i put my glasses on so i i'm gonna read all the comments and everything like that anybody <laughs> go ahead and share this on your page we do apologize for a little delay uh getting in uh, just a few things I had to do this morning. So thank you guys for bearing with us during the delay. Uh, but we are here. We are back at it. So go ahead, uh, Adrian, and share this on your page. I think I've already shared it on my page, man. Great, great dialogue. Um, Tina Turner, man, uh, I will say, um, when you watch the movie and you do watch her life, um, a person who took the cards that she was dealt and uh, became the alchemist, and spun it to gold. Uh, she reminds me a lot of the things that I went through in my life, uh, parental abandonment, uh, having to navigate through this world, uh, being victims of not only physical abuse, but mental and, and verbal abuse as well, but still 
pressing forward. You know, a lot of things that we go through are not gender specific. It's, it's human specific. So I always admired her story. And then uh, what's so funny, Tim, is uh, when I looked at her Wikipedia, she said to hell with America. She she fucked around and moved to Switzerland. <laughs> Got out of Dodge. <laughs> I, but I, I get it. I think once you live in a chaos for long enough, you just want silence. You just want to get away from that. Yeah, yeah. The very thing is, you live in London for a long time as well. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times, you know, the lesson that can be learned in that is like, because we're so programmed and indoctrined to hold on to family and family is everything and family is all you got. Sometimes you got to unplug from that. You know what I'm saying? You're yeah. Cool may not necessarily be your family you know? <laughs> yeah and it and it goes to show because you know she was along the lines of one of my favorites was whitney houston and it just goes to show like people can make a choice it, even if you decide at some point you don't deserve happiness like you can make other people happy you can give them the opportunity to be happy you know what i mean they don't everyone doesn't have to be miserable because you miserable <laughs> I mean, as, as perfectly said and sound, man, I mean, um, she tried to give her marriage a chance, of course, you know what I'm saying? For those who know the story, she was married to a brother, and the brother took her through, you know, 15 to 20 years of pure hell, you know? Uh, of course, when you understand Ike's story, too, that's why I love, you know, how the movie tells both sides. yeah. Ike was, uh, he was frustrated, man. I mean, Tina was his last and saving grace. So the funny thing about it was by the time he made it, mentally he couldn't believe that he was there. You know, all the years, yeah. of, I mean, if you heard, watch the movie, he's been all the years of him helping people's careers. They would make it to the top and they would leave him stranded back in wherever they were. And just, uh, I think it was St. Louis. So, I mean, his frustration, so honestly, his frustration was Tina was finding his golden goose that he could control. He could mentally control. Right. About to give up his golden goose for all his years of hard work. I'm not saying that Ike was right. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that you understood why he held on to Tina the way that he did. Yeah. And I think that just goes to show how a lot of things we're seeing and experiencing, especially in the past, was mental health. Like those are abandonment issues. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's getting left behind so much. You like, I ain't getting left behind this time. And you gonna right. go kicking and screaming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hands on her. I'm going. And 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 the funny thing about Ike is he knew she was impressionable because he raised her from nothing. You know what I'm mean? saying? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of the bands that he was, you know, developing, they were men. You know what I'm saying? So of course you right. can't but man, if you want to go, you gotta go. But him entangling the romant the romantic side plus the business, he was able to keep that lock and control on Tina, almost like a pimp. Yeah, yeah. And and how he was with her just shows how hard his life is. That that is to me the epitome of giving grace. You know, some things is hard to see and hard to hear without you getting upset. But we gotta take ourselves out of it and realize somebody hurt him. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it wrong. It just is. You know what I mean? It just is what it is. Like, and the people that hurt him, we can't reverse that. And some people just get on this this war path and they never get off of it. You know what I mean? But I think that's the important. It, it's funny, but it fits even to what we're talking about today. I think that's the importance of having the light. You know what I mean? Being that light. Like Tina Turner, she was that light. And it only takes a small amount of light, you know what I mean, to pierce darkness. But no amount of darkness can shut out the light, you dig? So she was a testament of that. Like, no matter how bad things got for her, she went out there and told, like, show people, enjoy life, have fun with life. You know what I mean? Take care of each other, take care of yourself. While yeah. she was being beaten down. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine carrying that tune while you live in the opposite. That's that's crazy to me. You you know one thing that I loved about Tina is that she timed everything. A lot of times that you know we grow up to think that 
or once we pray or once we make up our mind to do something that things are automatically going to change and we right. forget things are still a process. Like I, I want people to take from that, from that movie that even though Tina was introduced to Buddhism and, and things of that nature, what she learned was to find her peace even in the chaos. So even while she was doing her meditations, Ike was still acting the jack. I remember one scene where Ike was uh, hearing her chant and he would just turn the music up louder to fuck with her, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but she still stayed in her seat. She still stayed in her frame of mind like, okay, I know this man is trying to un unravel, trying to rattle me. I know this man is trying to get up under my yeah. seat. But I'm going, so a lot of times, I want to encourage people, like, when you're going through something and when things aren't clear, they may not be clear for a while, but what you have to do is just find that space in your head that says, you know what, I can't let this unravel me. I mean, I can't let this rattle me. I can't let this thing get me off balance. And that's one thing I admire about her, you know? Yeah, same. And I, and I got to give credit where it's due to uh, Lawrence Fishburne and Angela, Angela Bassett. I mean, their acting was impeccable. Yeah. I thought he was Ike Turner for when I for the long. <laughs> <laughs> he played but, that role so well. I said, "Wow!" But Tina was on location. That's one thing is yeah. she doesn't get the directing credit she deserves. Like she was on location during those times, and and she really made sure that the story was being told according to her. So you know that was a. Uh, that was, and, and she even said that there were certain times where it was way too real and she would have to leave set. Yeah. Because, hey, she, you, that's part of therapy too. When you're, when you're going through therapy, you're opening up these wounds again. You know what I'm saying? To tell yeah. you. So that's why when people tell their story, you can't just, you know, throw it to the wind and be like, oh, you know, no, these people are really trying to tell their story and tr really trying to heal themselves. So I, I totally got it when they said that Tina had to leave the set. A few yeah. times, it was way too real, and that's a and and people have to understand, you know what I mean. As much as they view that as entertainment, that is her release. She's putting that out there so she don't have to keep telling this story over and over again. Yeah, and it's a lot of times, you know, as people who are trying to be great, how I see it is, you don't want to just be known for this. You've done so many other things. <laughs> I don't want to meet someone and they're like, oh, yeah, what about Ike? Like, all right, let's talk about something. You know, I've done a lot more in my life than that. Yeah. She's done Live Aid. She's done, you know, uh, the whole Band-Aid situation, uh, especially in the age she did We Are the World. I mean, a lot of things uh, well before that story was told. Uh, so I get exactly what you're saying, interview after interview. What about Ike? I'm like, you know, that's that's. That was one part of my life. I'm in a new chapter now. So I feel what you're saying. Sometimes you got to write that book or do that movie. If you want to go back to that, refer back to yeah, that. Yeah, go watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk to me about it. Yes. And I, and I, and like I was saying earlier, I think that brings us, you know, perfectly into what you wanted to talk about today as well. The healers and the empaths versus the needy and selfish. You know what I mean? I think that's a beautiful segue. Yeah, um, oh, uh, one other reference, uh, uh, when Jay-Z said, you want the old ho, buy my old albums. Yeah. Learn how to move forward. We can't, yeah. if a person is not willing to lock themselves up in their past, why should we? You know what I'm saying? So right. Like, close that out. That's that, that was perfect, what you said. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to document it publicly. If you want to know, this is what it is. I'm moving forward. And you're able to stay there. You know what I mean? I've done that. I've done that in my own right. I have artists that I like that I don't love the newer stuff. So I just listen to the old shit. I just listen to the shit I like. I don't criticize the new stuff. I just go listen to the part where I was feeling you. You know what I mean? Like, that's why I love music and entertainment because it's timeless. I can go back and listen to a song from the 70s and just keep listening to that song. Yeah. I don't got to go find Ron Isley like, yo, what, I need something new. I, I need some. I need some right now, Ron. Like I, I can just go. You know what I mean. I don't even got to get him involved. Like so, we as people got to start taking that initiative. We expect too much out of these celebrities and superstars. It's, it's what's killing some of them. I won't say all of them, but yeah. it's what's killing some of them, man. Like mentally, you know what I mean. The exhaustion, the same thing we've seen back in the day from the musicians. We're starting to see again, which is scary. 
because we got new medicine, new doctors, new technology. Then you got what's happening to Jamie Foxx. So right. it's like we working these people too hard, man. They're humans. You know, and, and, and the thing is, is like um, when we start to develop, when we start to develop as people, you know, I say like we all come into the world selfish. We yeah. all come into the world. So nobody, I, 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 and let's be clear, everybody comes in the world born a narcissist. When you cry for milk, hey, it's about me. Yeah. <laughs> when you want to be held, it's about me. When you done pissed and shit on yourself and you need to be changed, it's about me. I don't care. I don't care what's going on around me. And I'm not going to stop crying until my needs are met first. And then so we're all born in the world narcissists. It's not until we get that brother or sister or when we go to kindergarten for the first time and somebody says, hey, little Timmy, share your toys. You know, it's not until we have somebody ingrained in us. It's not. It's not until we get popped on that on that that ankle or that 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 wrist and says, "Hey, this is not about you. You have to do what I tell you to do. You have to think outside of what you want to do what I tell you to do." So these are things that we're introduced to, and, and as kids, we don't like it. You know what I'm saying? You can see me. You tap that hand. They look at you like. I never did this before. Like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> you know, but um, it's the pain that yeah. impacts. It's the pain. And, and some people, they make a choice and a decision right there at three or four years old. I'm going to understand what you're feeling, or it's still like, oh, I'm going to rebel. I'm going, I, they make the choice right there. Like, I don't like that. I, I don't like that tap. And I'm still going to mess with the plug. Or I'm still going to mess. I'm still going to find out if that stove is hot. I'm still going. And this is why I said when I came up with the question today, we'll get to the question of the day, is this is kind of the, the divide a lot of times. A lot of empaths live with regret because they live in fear so much. Oh, don't do this. Or I can't do that. Or I don't want to do this. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm going to upset this person. I don't want to upset this person. So they never regret because even though they never got in trouble or they never jumped off the cliffs, they still don't know what's behind that door. They still don't know. Yeah. And, and the rebel or the narcissist like, oh, hell, fuck that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what's behind Absolutely. At 100%. And, and I had a similar path. You know what I mean? And for me as an empath, when things, when things click for me, it's because I don't, I don't mind trying the hard way first. You know what I mean? So when I was a kid, I'm like, all right, we're going we're gonna to try the hard way first. We're going <laughs> to quote, we're going to quote, unquote, listen. We're going to show up on time and do our work and be nice <laughs> and hold doors open for motherfuckers. Like, we're going to do all that, you know, because then karma going to give me a good life. So what snapped me from that is when I found out all that was bullshit. I found <laughs> out nice guys finish last. <laughs> I found out the mean people get finished first. They take what they want. The direct people are the ones that get the job, the one that get the marriage, the one that get the last sandwich, because you were sitting there waiting, like, I wonder if anybody else hungry. They just step up, like, I'll take it. You know what I mean? So I had to realize, oh, that was bullshit. And two, I had to be honest with myself. I think that's where we go wrong. You know what I mean? Especially with the children. We're just not being honest anymore. People are being too sensitive. And you hit the nail on the head. Like, we're all little narcissists. That cry is to, like, stop everything you're doing and come pay attention to me. And they get worse once they realize the cry works. Like, I can cry and you're just going to come <laughs> here and run and get me. That's when they become manipulative. They start doing it just because they to see how fast you go going to take. It's a track meet. They try to see how quick your time is now. Like, all right, I cried. It took her four seconds this time. She need to work on that. She need to get, she, come on, mom. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's okay. That happens. Like, we got to stop taking stuff so personally when someone else does something because we think they're doing it to us. You know what I mean? And, that, and that's the perspective that child is watching that adult from. You know, they think they know why you're doing what you're doing, and they just don't. So how we can counteract that is we got to give ourselves more information versus yeah. just say, you know, dad's being a jerk right now. Or mom told me no just to tell me no. You don't know why she told you no. So this is why as the parent, we got to communicate. This is why I, explain. I don't just tell my kids no. I tell you why I'm telling you no. 
Right. You know what I mean? So you don't have to go work your little mind to figure it out. I'm going to let you know. You dig? So we got to be more direct. Again, nice guys finish last. We got to be more direct. So, and, and this is why I, I tell people that Gandhi and Martin Luther King and a lot of our earlier leaders, and even, you know, when, when you look at the biblical leaders as well, there was a self-interest. There, there was a self-interest, whether it was favor, favor from the most high, for their family, favor from the people as far as leadership and, and being able to call the shots. There is a sort of narcissism when it comes to leadership. So even when you think of people that were just really gracious leaders like Mahatma Gandhi or, or Martin Luther King, there was still a level of narcissism. Well, we know now that Martin Luther King had a lot of narcissism. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> he was a very self-serving preacher. <laughs> but they had to hide that side to push his agenda. You know what I mean? Because, again, they had to make him look like a public figure. I like people that just naturally take on that position. You know what I mean? I've I've I, I've gotten so many gems from cinema and watching movies growing up and watching shows growing up. And the biggest thing I picked up is, like, the hero and the villain are the same. The only thing that's different is their means by behind how they're trying to get things done. But they have similar agendas. You know what I mean? The villain just doesn't have any where they're not willing to go to get done what they do. And the hero has boundaries. They have limits. You know what I'm saying? No great, no two greater characters can describe what you're saying than the Incredible Hulk and the Joker. Yes. And the reason why I say, let's start with the Incredible Hulk first. Yeah. The Incredible Hulk tried the nice approach. This is this is where me and you come in. We yeah. try to be nice. We try to be uh, fit into society. We try to be intellectual. We try to be diplomatic. We try to be civilized. And when we really discover that this gets you nowhere, we become that inner rage. Yeah. The Incredible Hulk, the Hulk itself represents rage. And this is what people need to really understand is that rage is inside of you, you, you pressed it, you suppressed it, you suppressed it until you can't, you can't push it down no more. What did Jay-Z say? Pressure busts pipes. So you got David Banner, who is pretty much the representative. Well, what we call a representative. David Banner is represents the suppressed person that tries to fit in, that tries to be nice and suppresses all these feelings. But when he turns into the credible hawk, he's had enough. <laughs> So that's a fact. So even though in comics we look at Incredible Hawk as a hero, but if you really look at Incredible Hawk, he gives it to everybody. He when he get mad, he give it to everybody, Superman included. You know, <laughs> anybody can get it, man. Anybody can get it when it comes to the Incredible Hawk, and um, when it comes to the Joker, um. When you really look at his backstory, you empathize. The, yeah. the, the Joker of the movie really had, because if, if you were to just say, oh man, this is the guy that's always giving Batman problems. Why is he always giving Batman? Why is he tearing up Gotham City? Why is he doing this? Because this is what we do with our outcasts. This is what we do with our, our meek and mild. This is what we do with our nerds. This is what we do with our geeks. We fuck with them all their life, and then they find an alter ego to be like, okay, I'm going to fuck with society. So Because who are you to think that you're better than me? You know what I'm saying? And this is yeah. why people like the Joker terrorize normal civilians. That movie showed you how evil civilians are. <laughs> yeah, that movie was so good. I know you talk. I know it's one you're talking about. The Joker movie? Yeah. The standalone? Yeah, that was so good. Because, I mean, that's the point he's always been trying to prove. You know, you, you let these people, and not even bat, not even just superheroes. We're talking about politicians, police officers, doctors. Like, you let these people dress up and play the hero when they're really the villain. And it's a thin line between what side you on. You know what I mean? With, yeah. He, see, that's where duality kicks in. That's the yin and yang is him and Batman. They both realize at some point they need each other. They, they wouldn't exist without each other. No one would give a fuck about the Joker if you wasn't the Batman's nemesis. 
You know what I mean? And no one would care about the Batman if you didn't have nobody to stop or nobody to beat up. That's the point that the Joker is trying to prove to the Batman over and over again, but he doesn't realize Batman already understands that. He's not saving people because he's a good guy. <laughs> he's saving people because he's an empath, because he got hurt one time so bad, he never wants anyone else to experience that type of hurt. Because look at what it's done to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And for the Joker, like, that's become his existence, trying to prove something to people, trying to... You know what I mean? Reassure them, like, oh, life's not as good as you want it. Like, life's actually really fucked up. I try to be the good guy, too, and lost everything. And now I became like this. See, that's what blinds us. You so focused on what happened to you, he don't realize you got everything around you now that you're saying you don't have or that was taken from you. Yeah, it looks a little bit different, but it's the same construct. You know what I mean? And we do the same thing in society. I think that's why... As us as black people were running out of the doctor's office because these things were just given to us as a friend, given to us as this is someone that's going to help. You know what I mean? Again, years after years now, you're watching your friends die. You're watching your friends get addicted to medicine. You're watching doctors accidentally kill people on the operating table. You start to wake up. You can't stay sleeping anymore in the midst of that. You know what I mean? Police are here to protect and serve, but you're seeing them kill people more than they save people. You can't act sleep no more. You can't pretend like that's not happening. But what do people do? They dive deeper into the internet, deeper into distractions, deeper into substance abuse, and they're trying to pretend like oh, like Columbus ain't got them. You know what I mean? You got Columbus has gotten crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I've been here a while. It wasn't like this back in the day. And I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's different. You know what I mean? It's it's real different. Well, this is why. Um, I remember, you know, there, there are some really key moments that, you know, uh, again, I always talk about the tumultuous relationship I had with my father, right? But there are some really good moments in my life that I had with him, and he shared some really dope wisdom. And one day he shared this song by Whispers, uh, and, and, and the title is, I want y'all to listen to it, it's like, Seems like I gotta do wrong, gotta do wrong, gotta do wrong before somebody notices me. You know what I'm saying? And it's a really deep song because it was like, man, why do I gotta turn the fuck up for me to be heard? You know what I'm saying? And and we wonder why, oh man, these kids are wilding out. These kids are killing each other, this, that, and the other. It's like because they're not being heard. They 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 pleaded like we need more programs in schools. I wanted to play football, but you cut out the school programs. I wanted to to dance and do art and this that and the other, but you know you got my mom working two or three jobs just to pay the mortgage. So man, this is all you're giving me. And so yeah. I, you know that song is so relevant when it comes to people like the Joker. Is like like you said, Batman. He had the means and the resources because he was a rich person. So his cause is worthy because I got the money to get the Batmobile. I got the money. Exactly. But the Joker, he's he, you know, all he has is his brain. But oh, this is this is what you're gonna notice me by? I bet. Well, I'll be the villain. But at least you're writing about me in the paper. At least you're paying attention to who I am. So what you said, that duality. Sometimes we want to, you know, villainize the villain, but the villain, yeah. like, the only way, um, what did Kodak Black say? Man, I seen that reel. That was crazy. He was like, man, you know, y'all criticizing me for being a thug, but, man, at the beginning, all I really wanted was a hug. Like, goddamn. Yeah. <laughs> but if you want to put money on the table, like Tupac said, and he said, and thugging just got, got me multi-platinum, I'm going to keep thugging for my family. Mm-hmm. And that's where times that's where times have changed. You know, they took the initiative back then. And that's what we're missing these days. We have so many kids who are numb because they're forced to grow up. And this is what I firmly believe are slavery tactics. It's it's we talked about it before on the show. It's the well, I'm gonna make sure you're not out there being a kid because they out there snatching kids, the police killing kids. So we're gonna we're gonna age you a little bit. You know what I mean? I'm going to make sure you're out there being taken care of independent. So you're going to start dating a little early. You're going to get to know these men. Like, they're trying to age you a little bit. And back in the day, they had those people to put their foot down. Like, nah, this ain't okay. They had the people that was going to intervene. Think about during the pandemic. Like, 
the city and the rec centers was taking the rims off of courts. Kids couldn't even play no more. When I was a kid, if something like that would have happened, there would have been a man in the neighborhood going to put the rim back on the on the fucking backboard. <laughs> Immediately. That day. That day. You would have seen them carrying the rim with all this shit to put it. See, you. so kids were seeing that. They were seeing hope. Now you just see the backboard. And they're just like, well, there ain't no court no more. You know, and everybody move on with their life. And kids is losing rec centers. And they losing libraries. And they losing places to actually go that we had as outlets. Right. I remember walking to the corner store and to the rec with the homies and being there all day. You know what I mean? Kids don't have that anymore, but we also had adults that was fighting for that. They yeah. was going down to talk to whoever they needed to talk to to make sure this was going on. You get what I'm saying? And a lot of it is is, is the narcissist to me is everybody going for self. And that's terrible for community. That might be great for your household, but that sucks for the community. There's a lot of kids who don't have no home to come to. They don't have no father figure, no mother figure to look up to. Like, they were depending on you going to put that realm back on that court. So yeah. I think we got to start changing how, like, how our movements affect everybody else. Right. And, and, and people, just to give the distinction, empath, of course, empathize. You're, you're looking at the reaction or the consequence or what the final effect is going to be before you consider yourself. You're considering everyone else sometimes before you consider yourself. So it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes the empath depletes him or herself more than pours into themselves. Because, yes. you know, if you have that picture of water or Kool-Aid and, you know, the correct measurements are for seven cups, but you got eight and you're the eighth person. By the time you pour the correct measurements, you're not going to have enough. You know what I'm saying? But you're happy. So you, you tell your mind you're happy because everybody else is drinking except me. As long as everybody else is happy, I'm cool. Right. And, then, and if you go along with that, then that's fine. But how many times are you going to allow that to happen? You know, how many times are you going to pour that seven cup before, you know, say you start pouring a little bit, you don't give them the correct measurements. You, <laughs> because you got to have some too. You know, you go start littler and littler to that person because you were like, you know what? This is about the third time this has happened. And I never get any water. Yeah. See, this is, um, that was a beautiful, beautiful analogy because it, it definitely segues into what I feel like is the word of the day and we've used this word a few times on the show and i i think this is a word like my generation needs you know what i mean along with like passion and rediscovering family but it's discernment you know what i mean and a lot of people have no discernment and see this is where i get into my my bible wars when i get into it with the church because they've twisted a lot of these words you know what i mean to work against us you dig? So they're good words. They're words we should be using, like grace. They're words we should be using, but we're we're too afraid of what they mean because we don't know. And we're too afraid to ask what they mean because we feel we should know. You dig what I mean? So the sermon is the ability to judge well. That's the lamest terms definition. The biblical definition is the perception in the absence of judgment with the view of obtaining spiritual guidance and understanding. Similar, but different. You know what I mean? So, and you need both. That's the beauty of it. This is where duality kicks in. We, we got to stop looking for, oh, should I take one or the other? Sometimes shit, you need both. So the discernment in that situation is becoming aware. We've all been in that situation to where, all right, it's seven cups. I'm the eighth person. So you have to have discernment. It depends on what area you're in in your life. When it comes to things as far as my education, you know what I mean? My entertainment, my family. Right. I'm pouring. I'm pouring my cup first, right? Immediately, the empath in me, yes, is going to fill away. You know what I mean. And the empath in me feels away because I know what it feels like to be that person without that cup. You know what right. I mean. So sometimes I will be that person. Shit, most times I am that person who doesn't. You don't even take your cup out because you know it's not going to be enough. Right. But we have to start attaching two parts of our lives to where we get the first drink. And 
it's not the problem that we get the first drink. It's the guilt we take with us. It's the regret we take with us. We have to release that regret. Like, givers, this is a giver's season. We have to be more selfish. We've been giving everything because we don't, we never set a limit. You know what I mean? As much as life is about giving and taking, it's more about moderation. You finding your middle balance to how much you feel comfortable giving, how much you feel comfortable receiving. Right. Dig? On my spiritual journey, I don't want to drop less or drop more than what's for me. <laughs> so if Lane come and say he got $100 for me, I don't want 95 I don't want 105 I right. just want my $100. <laughs> you dig? Like, I... That's it. That's my moderation. That's me knowing my truth. So when it comes to now this situation and I got to pour out these cups, if all these first seven cups is my children and their cups are getting full, you know what I mean? If this area is my career, my passion, my peace, my cup has to get poured first before I pour it, before I even think about pouring anyone else's. Because I may realize when I pour that one cup for me, I really only had enough for one cup. I'm just going off of in the past, I had enough for seven. One month, I had enough for 14. But where are you at today? Because if you only got enough for one, and you going ahead and pouring that out to one person, now you got seven motherfuckers upset, not just you. You got seven people hurting. But if I can pour myself, those other seven people are now, I'm holding them accountable. Because if you my friend, they're going to be like, all right, he, was, he needed that. That's why he did that. If you against me, you're going to be like, oh, why he pour his, his own cup first? He couldn't have poured for us. You got to go. I'm glad I poured for me first. You know what I mean? That's the discernment. And that's a case by case basis. We get in trouble in life because we're trying to handle some shit how we handled some shit in the past. You got to look at this with new eyes and a new mind and a new heart. You know what I mean? Or you start to become numb to the outcome. And it, and, and this is why like it, it meshed so well because even what you said about the song, I have an affirmation that's like that. You know what I mean? I made a shirt about that. And I, and I and I told, and this is mostly for my generation and under. And I'm like, we're hurting, we're hurting ourselves just to feel something. Like it's starting <laughs> to feel like you inflicting pain just because you've been so numb to human touch or human emotion. Now you gotta shit on yourself or take the short end of the stick just to feel alive, just to feel like you're getting the human experience. Because they've told us it's suffering. You dig? Suffering is what makes you human, but it's not the only thing that makes you human. We also got to experience abundance and love, you dig? But that starts at home. So if you give away all the best parts that you have for yourself, I mean, where you, where's your confidence going to be at? Where's your security going to be at? It's You gave it away, you dig? So we got to start learning sometimes. It's okay to pour your cup first and enjoy that drink. See, and, and, and remember, let's go back to the last analogy. You know, Let's say you're used to that 100%. Well, all of a sudden, you know, them cups is getting shorter and shorter. Now you're used to that 100%, but I took, you know, at least a little bit off of everybody's just so everybody could, you know. And a lot of times we feel like we want to hold people guilty because they have to do what they have to do to survive. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's in the household. That's on the job. And stuff like that. Sometimes you, we all remember when we worked them two jobs or we had to do something. We was up all night with our kids and we snuck to the bathroom to get them 20 minutes of Z's or we went to the yeah. car quick. And we, <laughs> I mean, everybody's been there. Everybody stole company time. Yes. <laughs> At one point or another, where somebody, you know, you really needed that vacation and you called in sick. I mean, it's because. I pour this into my company every single day. Now, I know my company gives me a wage. I know my company gives me enough money to pay my bills and survive, but I still have to live as well. We, we, we talk about that work-life balance, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, my wife wants to spend time with me and have a three-day weekend. I put in a request and they tell me, well, no, uh, <laughs> we need you here on Friday. What do you think that I'm going to do? I'm going exactly. to lie. I'm going to lie. You're now forcing me to lie. Yeah. <laughs> I told you what I needed, and you decided not to give it to me. Now, I give you every every day. I give you hard work. But now, now somebody sees me on Instagram, or somebody sees me on somebody's live. 
oh, he's not working. Now I come back to work and get reprimanded, which is it really fair that you reprimand me when I asked you for this day off? <laughs> I mean, am, I, am I preaching or am I not? Yeah, nah, you on point. You on so, point. So, so we want to judge people. I mean, and I, we'll, we'll get into infidelity. We'll, we'll, we'll get into infidelity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to talk about the good side of infidelity or the justifiable side. To okay. Infidelity. You know what I'm saying? People don't want to talk about the justifiable side of infidelity because a lot of times these women and men are screaming, hey, I need this. Yeah. I need this from you. Yeah. And you choose to continue to ignore it. And then you wonder why this person who who has this person on the side says, hey, I'll give it to you. Man, it happens every day. It happens every day. And I think that's the point to where I live intentionally. You know what I mean? I don't get upset when people cheat. I don't get upset when people steal from their job. I don't get upset, you know, people take naps in church. <laughs> I just feel like if you go, how I look at the world is if you're going to do some shit, do it. Like, that's, this is the difference between when you get the guilt and the regret, you know, see, I, I don't have that. Like when I was on that job sleeping for that hour, oh, I had my blinders on. I had my Snuggie. I'm getting comfortable. I'm, I'm reclining my car seat all the way back. And then there's the other person car next to me, my colleague, every five minutes, they pop out of their sleep, think they getting in trouble or somebody opening their door. I'm, I'm asleep. If I'm going to steal company time and take a nap, this going to be the best nap I ever had it because if I can't take the nap, if I'm gonna be the every five minute person, I might as well go back to work. Like you can't have it two ways. Either you gonna do it or don't do it. You feel me? I don't. This is another truth we gotta accept. Judgment's everywhere in the world. I just try to judge fairly. <laughs> so I don't judge you for what you're doing. I judge you that you sneaking to do it. If you gonna do it, get that sneaky shit out the way. You gonna do it? Do it. I don't know, Tim, because. I've I, I stolen 20 minutes because I'm falling asleep on the phone with these clients. So I'm sure they're like, no, I mean intentional. I mean, when you know you hiding from work, you know they looking for you. When you hide from work, you hear your colleagues, did they ask about me yet? Just go back to your desk. Why go through all of that torment? If oh, I'm yeah. missing, I'm gone. Ain't nobody going to find me. I'm missing. You going to point. You going to point. If you going to do it, do it all the way. If you going to do the crime, and it's, it's almost like my grandmother told me this one time when she caught me, you know, and, and she knew where I was at. So she called and was like, well, you know, you might as well have a great time because you Thank know you. what's waiting on you when you come. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> have a book. And she, she, she meant that. Like, have a yeah. book, you know, because this is what's going to happen when you get back. <laughs> so why, why have two ass whoopings? You might as well <laughs> get turned. And then come back to that. You know what I mean? But we see it all the time in society. I was always that person at work. You know, I'm on the phone. My homie keeps texting me. They looking for me. Yo, just, just come back, fam. Just come back. <laughs> Your homie keeps talking about he about to rob the bank. He asks you all these questions. Just go get a job, fam. That that ain't that ain't for you. Like, some of these things you just got to dive into. You try to talk yourself in and out of it. Just, just don't do it. That's my advice. Just leave it alone. Clearly, you don't want to do it. You dig? Like, and we need that discernment. We need that directness. Again, that's what I feel like is the nice guys finish last. See, society and movies try to turn that against us. They try to, oh, don't ask the girl out. Don't simp for your woman. Not nah, simp for your woman. Don't simp for this girl who's giving you no fucking play, who's giving you no attention. She almost looks uncomfortable by you talking to her. Leave that woman alone, you dig? Like, don't be going back in your head, should I say, should I not, should I write her a letter, check this box? No, leave her alone. She's communicating with you, you dig? So we got to start being able to pick that up. But men, that's where our ego and our pride start working against us. Because to be a man, what they teach us, you got to take what you want. You got to take your woman. You got to take your job. You want that house you want with your neighbor got? You got to go take it. So now we never learn how to ask. We never learn how to be vulnerable, how to put ourselves out there. So now everything is, you know what I mean? It's either aggression or we're being aggressive. But because we need that discernment, man. Adrian said car naps were the best. <laughs> oh, car man. naps save lives. And they do. No, and I like it. And, and, and it really, car naps 
every ladies and gentlemen, it's just a metaphor. It's a metaphor <laughs> to say, at what point do you deplete yourself? At what point do you allow your significant other to kill you? Well, at what point do you allow your children to kill you? At what point do you allow your job to kill you? And when I say it like this, everybody's had this analogy, and I know everybody's seen it, but this really happened at PNC Bank. And I know they are going to know what I'm talking about. A person went out to their car for a nap. This is a perfect segue. Went out to their car for a nap. Died in their car while they were taking a nap. Their job was posted before 5 o'clock that evening. Now, this is lunchtime we're talking about, right? They went out there in their car for a nap. No, actually, they didn't steal company time. I'm sorry. They didn't steal company time. It was on their break, I think. I'm sorry? It was on their break, I think. It was on their break. I know what you're talking about. Or on, on their time, died, and the job was posted before 5 p.m. So that's the point. What? Why? Why are you gonna allow something to kill you? You know what I'm saying? And and and, and it's cool because we let's go back to your biblical principles. We yeah. are to, we are to serve. We are to serve. Exactly. Who's gonna serve you? Who's serving you? Who's making sure you're okay? Who's making sure you're fine? Because at the end of the day, you might have to steal some water from them seven cups. You might have to steal some company time. You might have to not tell somebody where you're going in order to get that piece. You might have to hide somewhere. So this is what I'm saying is that you got to make sure you're okay. And you're not a bad person for it. We always try to make somebody feel bad for a selfish move. Selfish is not a bad word. Isn't that crazy? And, and, and you have one of the most criminal industries in the world, which is the banking industry, doing things that they don't get criticized for. You know what I mean? I was doing some research yesterday and I learned that apparently <laughs> in the past, banks had what was called, the, it was called a dead man's clause. So they were literally taking life insurance out on their older employees. They were literally hiring some people that were terminally, terminally ill just to take a life insurance policy out on them. And, uh, and this wasn't happening a lot of, this was happening all over the country, but only a few states in the South was actually fighting it. And then Florida agreed with the banks, like that they were able to do that. So they found out because this black lady, she were, his her son was a teller. He was like in his thirties, he passed away. She got a letter saying, yeah, the life insurance policy was cashed on your son, $400,000. She didn't see a penny of that didn't see a dime she's like how is this even legal how is this even lawful you know what i mean it came out they got sued multiple times they still are in court to this day for it they don't get criticized they're not bad at all your your job should be able to do shit like that like they got people so brainwashed it's sick but if i steal 10 minutes on the clock i'm a bad person <laughs> if i don't come in because they didn't give me my vacation i'm a bad employee it's got to work two ways, man. Your job has no interest in you. They want employees. And that could be anybody who can do this fucking job. I'm I'm stealing time. I'm I'm stealing time. I'm stealing office supplies. Don't hire me. <laughs> Don't <laughs> hire me. <laughs> it reminds me of uh that that guy that went into drug employment in the 80s. And I don't know if a lot of people remember is that um a lot of you know you got over the counter behind the counter but a lot of behind the counter was accessible. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the child, his child at home was suffering from a bad ear infection. And uh, the guy jumped the counter for a moxicillin, you know what I'm saying? And uh, ended up doing some some crazy time behind it, you know? And it, it, even as a, cause I was a kid in the eighties, of course, but even as a, a kid in the eighties, I just felt something wasn't right about that. Like, you know, it's like this man is, you know, what did you think he was going to do? You know, <laughs> I mean, if, if I guess they ran out of insurance and maybe he was employed, maybe he was, I don't know the backstory of why he did it, but he did it for his crying baby who was suffering from an ear infection and jumped behind that counter and stole some amoxicillin. You know what I'm saying? So we got to understand a lot of times 
that we want to condemn the criminal, but we don't want to rehabilitate the things that got him to that point. You know what I'm saying? Um, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to unearth uh, anybody. But we we always are transparent on this show. We always tell the truth. But uh, this is a true story. I was. Uh, and I'm still going to do this documentary. If I ever get the money to do this documentary, I'm going to do this documentary. And it was about a, a, a serial killer in Columbus. Um, he, he terrorized the 90s, and I dare not say his name because it, it still pumps fear. <laughs> and a lot of his name really still pumps fear in a lot of people, man. And uh, even as I was asking certain people for permission to do the documentary, I said, man, we... Man, there's still a lot of people hurt behind that guy. You know what I'm saying? And we we can't do it. But I will say this. When my dad came home, I said, hey, uh, I want to do a documentary about so-and-so. He said, oh, for real? Oh, shoot, hold on. Let me call his family real quick. And talk to his family. Some of the nicest people you ever want to meet in the world. You know, just regular down home people. I talked to them and they and they said, well, you know, uh, you know, we would have to get clearance from a lot of people. Now, when we were referring to this guy, and I know by this time everybody knows who I'm talking about right now. Um, I asked my father about him because they were cellmates, or at least they were on the same block. Mm -hmm. And you know what made him do what he did? And I said, no, dad, what made he said, Man, that dude was a really good guy, a very nice smile, very, you know, just a happy-go-lucky guy. And he just got tired of people taking advantage of him. He got tired of people treating him a certain way. So he felt he had to be this way, and he made himself this way to get the respect that he deserved. And he is still, that name still strikes fear in a lot of people. This man been away for a long time, you know, <laughs> but... I, I, I want, if I do this documentary, I want that side of the story told before we talk about the reign of terror that he caused in the 90s. It's crazy. I feel like I know, I definitely feel like I know who you are. <laughs> Everybody knows who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's one of my homies' dads, if I'm sure. I think I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I can't even mention his name on his broad because, like I said, even the very mention of his name shocks yeah. what infamous yeah for yeah. sure but i i think you're touching on a very very important topic you know what i mean and this i think this is why i constantly you know i can speak for myself give background when i say like i've been in the hood and it's not it's, it's the same with tupac everybody in the hood ain't a thug everybody in the hood ain't a street nigga everybody in the hood ain't hood some of those are just people that live in the hood so <laughs> by being in the hood and meeting a lot of those people Let's call it spade a spade. Most of the terrorists that came into the hood was moving in with grandma, either didn't have parents or terrorized their parents, had to come live with grandma. Now this neighborhood is starting to turn around into a different type of neighborhood. And there's multiple kids that they're looking for a sense of family. You know what I mean? So they we never talk about how they were pushed to this point. And a lot of them was, look at the area they're in. So you're not seeing people when you go out the door and your grandma is probably the most important thing to you in the world. Yeah. And you're not seeing people respect her and open doors for her. You're seeing niggas trying to snatch her purse. You're seeing the church trying to take money from her. You're seeing the bit, the people, city trying to take her house. You know what I mean? You see people trying to come up and scam her every day. People trying to call and scam her. That's going to piss you off. That's yeah. going to start turning you against the world when you have this nice, delicate flower and everybody's trying to trample it. You're yeah. going to become a bigger threat than what you feel everybody is. And no one ever talks about that with that kid. And, they, and they've been rejected their whole life. And they've been in and out the system. And they've been in and out homes. You dig? So Kodak, when do they get their hug? When does somebody come up and say, you know what, I get it. I know what you're going through. You know what I mean? It's usually when they getting carted off to prison. It's usually at their funeral. It's usually when they've gone too far left. You know what I mean? And that, where is that shit? They don't get no sympathy. They don't get no empathy. It's just straight judgment, judgment, judgment. And I've watched my brother do the things he had to do. It's always in the name of protection. It's always in the name of you got this person fucked up. It's not because I woke up and wanted to do this. It's because they really see the world for how it is. 
And that's a hard pill to swallow, man, especially when you already got undiagnosed, unhealed mental shit going on. Yeah. That's that's a crazy cocktail going so, on right there. So here, here, here we'll come to the reality. Here on Reflection Thursdays, we don't we don't sugarcoat nothing. We don't hold your hand through it. We get us to you raw and uncut. So now let's get into some raw and uncut. Every CEO that you can think of right now. And I hate to say this, but even going through business school, business school at Ohio Dominican University, stu doing doing clinical studies, doing you know psych psychological studies, every CEO that you know is a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Every one of them, not one. Jay Z, Master P, Puff Daddy, Donald Trump, Steve Jobs, Rick Ross. <laughs> Jamie Dimon. <laughs> Every CEO that you know. So we come here talking about, I want to be a CEO. I want to be a boss. Right. The question is, do you really have what it takes to be a boss? Do you really have the guts to put your needs before your employees? Do you really have the guts to put your company's needs before the employees? Because we go back to that whole still a company time. Your boss is a narcissist. I'm talking about the CEO because he doesn't care about you got five. Uh -huh. He doesn't care that you're working two jobs and that you got in, you know, 45 minutes early just to get this report. He don't care about that. Uh -huh. He don't care that your wife is getting ready to divorce you because you're spending 70 hours a week at work. The CEO cares nothing about that. They only care about the bottom line. So everybody's talking about, I mean, let's really put these parallels together. Boss, narcissist, <laughs> you have to have that element Absolutely. in order to succeed because you have to go above and beyond what's human empathy, which is natural for us. You have to go above and beyond human empathy to consider always, not one day, not two days, but every day, the bottom line over human needs. It's not to say that you can't show compassion or charity or show some sort of humanness when it comes to the morale of your employees, your subordinates or whatever. Everybody does that. Even military sergeants or military right. leaders, and they have to have something, but it's still the bottom line, it's not because they really want to be humanly, emotionally kind to you. It's that they, they know they have to have some balance to steal, <laughs> you know? They got to be cutthroat. You know what I mean? They got to be cutthroat. That's why the government is the most criminal of us all. You yeah. know, even Elon Musk said, he, he said 90% of drug dealers run businesses better than CEOs and Fortune 500 companies and people on Wall Street. They know better math. They're better with people. The difference is you have to be cutthroat. You have to be willing to have this employee who's a six-figure earner just bought this new house and fire them and be okay with them living on the street and their family not eating anything for the next 10 years until they figure it out. You got to go to bed with that at night. You know what I mean? This is what helps me stay level in who I am. This is why I'm strategic about what I want to do. I, I'm going to be successful. It's not something I'm, you know, if and or but about. I'm going to be successful. But I don't want no level of success to where I get older and, and my mind is, is scrambled eggs. And I don't want to have to do anything that I'm going to regret in the long run to become successful. Those are things I said for myself. You know what I mean? So if me being successful is $60,000 a year, there it is. You dig? But if making 300000 means I got to go step on some black people's necks, I just I don't want to do it because I don't want to have to live with that blowback. I'm not, I don't want to have to you know fight myself to sleep at night because of what I did to get where I am. I just don't think it's worth it. I think I think people like Oprah and Tyler Perry rationalize that because of all the people that they help, that they rationalize their shrewdness. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, you you hear one side of Oprah, she's the most philanthropist person that you know. You hear another side of Oprah, <laughs> motherfucker. Bad <Yeah>. news. <laughs> But let's say, but let's be honest to us people. Do we be surprised when we hear the other shit? No. <laughs> Do we be surprised? <laughs> when no. I heard how odd Patty was, I wasn't surprised. And I love Patty. Love her, love her like the odd I never knew, never had. You know what I mean? But when I heard it was more than them pies and how she be treating and talking to people, 
when I heard about Gladys Knight and how they be treating and talking to people, I was I wasn't I didn't question it. I wasn't like, oh, these people lie. I was just like, well, I mean, it do seem like you got a little spice to her. I, I don't know. <laughs> don't put this on Patty off, I guess. <laughs> that's that's the term diva. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother wasn't a millionaire, but she was the same way. She was the very exact same way is that to the world and what she presented was this sweet old lady. But in my house, oh, woo wee that was a mean woman, boy. My grandmother was mean as fuck. And I, God rest her soul, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, <laughs> evangelist Mary C. Whiteside, my God. They be like, oh my gosh, she is so sweet. Mother, they called her Mother Whiteside, or they called her Evangelist Mary White, because she was a preacher, you know what I'm saying? I and I would see it in church, you know, people would just worship and adore her. And I'm like, y'all don't understand this woman. <laughs> me. <laughs> oh man. But that's the shit you be missing the most. But yeah, like that's how I was because my grandma was a deacon. And I, I I don't know if it's a hard life from what they seen in the church, but they are some stern women. Like she say shit, I'll just look at her like, did you have to say that? And be so unapologetic. Like, yeah, I know they heard me. Like, damn, grandma, like, take it easy. Yeah, yeah. But but you you have to understand, and and this is why this whole submissive and women ain't taking this stuff no more. I said, man, that's this is not new. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. Is not new. We had a lot of my aunties and grandmas wasn't playing that shit. And they told you what you can do with your room. They told their husbands what you can do with your room. If you want this dinner on the table at five o'clock, listen, I would advise you to shut the book up. You know? right. <laughs> <laughs> but they understood, okay, I'm not putting dinner on the table at five o'clock because I'm serving this man. I'm putting dinner on the table at five o'clock because I need him to go to work. I need him exactly. to do the job that I need him to do. So if I nourish him and, and, and make sure that his clothes are properly ironed and stuff like that, I'm not ironing his clothes because I'm like, oh, yes, sir, and this, that, and the other. I'm ironing his clothes because he's the only breadwinner here. So I want to make sure that when he goes to work, see, I'm, I'm preaching again. When he goes to work, oh, here you are. So therefore, his boss is going to look at him and say, oh, Jim always comes to work on time. He always comes with his uniform press and everything like that. But that's the credit to the woman who understood the bigger picture. Like, I got to make him to be the man that he needs to be because he's the chief breadwinner of my home. So therefore, I'm going to have his dinner on the table at 5 o'clock. I'm going to give him at least the peace of mind that he has so that he can get back out there and work them two jobs again. See, people don't really understand that. All this submission and subservience. But if he raised too much sand in the house, mama went on strike for a whole week. I'm like, yeah. talk to me like that again and see what's going to happen. See, they, they get it twisted, Tim. They really do. Oh, 100%. And that's where even the other side, too, is where us men get it twisted. You know what I mean? Because Grandpa Earl had to be still submissive back in the day. But he protected the woman. He overstood, okay, she's doing all this so I can get to work. When I come home, I got to make sure she's taken care of. I got to make sure she's good. I got to make sure, she, all right, you get off your feet. Let me go make sure the kids did what they needed to do when they chores. Let me go walk through the house. It, it has to be a reciprocation. And nowadays, each side is looking for the other side to do some shit you ain't doing for them. You got to want to do it for them. You know what I mean? If you don't, maybe it's time to leave. But nobody understands the bigger picture. Nobody understands that the roles are just the mechanics the same way the company works. The vice president doesn't have the foresight of what the CEO does, but basically that report is going to be there on time for that business meeting for the CEO. So the CEO can say, everything's good here, everything's good here. All right, everybody go back to what they was doing. You know what I'm saying? But I need to see the full picture because I can't do what the vice president does. I can't do what the treasurer does. I can't do what the CFO does. But as long as I can see the big picture, I can still guide this ship where it's supposed to go. And this is what people don't understand. It's not how I feel about you. Tim, you can be my vice president. I don't give a fuck about you. But we right. both come together for this company. You need a check and I need a check too. So what does that matter how I like you or not? Yeah. And then that gets down to brass tacks on why we're here and how this is going to function. Because it can only go two ways. 
either we're going to trust each other's process or we're going to try to control each other's process. And to me, that control is when things start going left. It's when things start unraveling. There has to be some sense of trust. You know what I mean? And with me, romantically, business-wise, friendship, once the trust is gone, I have to leave. Like, it, it doesn't matter the state of how everything is going. It doesn't matter how much money on the table. I have to trust that I'm going to be protected. I have to trust that I'm going to be respected and love and value. You know what I mean? I can't control you to do those things for me. I can't scare you into doing those things for me. I have to trust that you're going to go. And if it's time to leave, I have to trust nothing's going to change. <laughs> So this is what's helping me leave. You know what I mean? But it has to be trust. Man, you know, I was reading that too. Uh, man, you, you, you in my head and you in my book, you're in my book this week, Tim, because Robert Greene said the same thing. He said, in order to get compliance, in order, I'm sorry, in order to get the best compliance, you have to get the buy-in. Almost as if it's that person's idea of doing it themselves. Yes. You can get compliance based off of fear, but that's only going to build resentment over time. And it's going to be the adverse and even a worse effect than if you, you know, wanted the natural compliance to begin with. But a lot of times, going back to what you said, you're automatically going to raise people's defenses when you challenge their belief system or when you challenge their will their will to do something, but you can't communicate in a way to say, I need this from you. You know what I'm saying? And, and then pose the question, are you willing to give this to me? Is, is, is there, should there be a social contract to say, if you give this to me, I must give this to you. There's nothing wrong with leverage at all. You know what I'm saying? There's charity and then there's, there's an exchange. Uh, but it's based on your social contract and how that, that contract is going to work. So at the end of the day, but if I say, you're going to stop going to the club, well, do you want me to sneak and go to the club? I mean, I know I'm in a relationship, but hell, I like clubbing. Right. You know? <laughs> right. You're going to stop drinking and smoking. You're going to stop going to the strip club. Well, damn, I was doing all this shit before I met you. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, I mean, and, and I understand it. You threatening to leave me is only going to hold me for so long. But either when I'm going to do one or two things, either watch you walk out the door, or I'm going to go behind your back and have that puff of that cigarette. I'm going to go behind your back and have that swig because this is something that's a part of me. It's part of my trauma. It's part of my trigger. It's part of my thought process. It's part of my relief. It's part of my relaxation. All these things that help me cope with life. So when you said that you love me, I just assume that you loved all of me, you know? <laughs> exactly. Which, how it should be. You know what I mean? But if not, everything they're saying to you starts to become that trigger. Like, I tell people this in therapy. I tell people this in real life. There is no room in relationships for ultimatums. Like, once y'all making ultimatums, like, start packing y'all shit. It's y'all on the way out. There's no room for that. You know what I mean? Because now you're trying to convince each other to love each other and be with each other. Like, when it makes sense, it's going to be easy in a sense. You don't have to question each other about every single thing. The work is going to be hard because you still got to get to know every other part of each other. Right. But if you tripping up at the beginning, you ain't going to make it to the end. You know what I mean? Like, that has to be effortless. Y'all got to already have that chemistry and that dynamic, which I believe our generation never had relationships that stem from friendships. A bunch of us was just dating and then getting in relationships. You didn't know this person on a friend level. You know what I mean? You didn't really get to know their flaws when you had no invested interest in them. You dig? So now all of that's blowing up in our face. We're not taking our time because I think most people are too afraid what they're going to find. They want to ignore all that shit and just focus on the good shit and hope that's going to manifest in their life. No, you should be looking for every single part of that person. If not, this not the person for you. You know what I mean? Like, that's our discernment. And we waiting for that motherfucker to break up with us. No, you need to leave. You're out of place. You may make sense for them. But the moment that you realize you're not ready to reciprocate, reciprocate what they have to give, you got to yeah. step. See, this is man and woman. When we were younger, they just used to tell men this. Like, well, don't talk to her if you're going to waste her time. The fuck? She shouldn't talk to me if she's going to waste my time. Like, that's a two-way street. You dig? Like, that's not just our responsibility. Come on, like, this is how we got to start working together. Men got to do so much shit. Then women got to do so much shit. What are we doing together? Let's talk about that. 
You, you know, it's funny. I, 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 we're talking about impasse and narcissists and things of that nature. And, you know, I always try to protect the innocent and the guilty. But I think when I tell the story, you guys are going to know exactly what I'm talking about because I know too much in detail. But I'm, I'm going to leave the name out of it. So, okay. Uh, there was there was this gentleman who, you know, um, he had this reputation for women. And he he never lied to any of his women. Like I'm a womanizer, you know what I'm saying? If you wanna you wanna fuck with me, then that's cool. But you know, I'm telling you, I'm a ladies' man. So, you know, uh do what you will. So he was already uh messing with this lady who was well to do. I won't even say her occupation because you guys probably really know. Uh, but he was messing with this woman out of town. And so uh he came back into his hometown and uh kind of reacquainted with himself from a woman he knew a while back so um long story short she said i i want i want to mess around with you i want to i want to be with you and so uh he was like well you know i got this situation over here and i got this situation over here but you know if you want to then let's let's make something happen so they did she ended up catching feelings right mm -hmm. so as, as 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 people often do <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when he went to go make a trip to go see, you know, who she already knew about, she goes into this rage, like, I can't believe you're doing this. Da, 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 da. And not only did he say, well, you know, this was a social contract. This is what we agreed to. And so she really threw out the word love. Like, no, I, I love you, this, that, and the other. And I couldn't understand, like, okay, this person really does love you. You know what I'm saying? And I'm looking at this person like, yo, why are you doing this person like that? Why don't you just cut off everybody for her? And so he explains to me, he said, listen, this woman pays my rent. This woman pays my car note. This, and, and I'm situating myself when it comes to my company. And these women have agreed to do this for me. So he tells the women, like, he tells the, the one girl that's throwing the fit, like, if you're willing to take out the slack, I'll be more than happy to cut them off. <laughs> but if you don't. I can love then... you right back. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what she did? She laid her ass around with them two other women in <laughs> Yeah, like, because what, what you, you don't know what you're asking for. You know what I mean? And, and I think that's very rampant in, like, the society with men not his situation but that premise you know what i mean and i see a lot of men speaking this and i and i have the same from experience from friends from relationships family all types of shit like sometimes you're being loved for what you can do or the potential you have or yeah. a gift that you have you dig but somebody that see me once a month it's harder for me to say you love me you don't really know me you're like what you love about me <laughs> <laughs> because if it's things i say and things i do that's not me Right. You dig? That's a part of who I am. And a lot of times, men, we accept that because a man's looking for that. So as soon as somebody tell you they love you, you head over heels. You don't know how to act, don't know how to move, can't <laughs> breathe, you dig? And it's like, I ask them, like, what you love about me? Really have that conversation. You know what I mean? And I think these will start to put us in favorable positions. But I, you hit the nail on the head earlier with cheating. And it's funny when I see people talking about, you know, polygamy and different shit online. When you in a relationship and y'all cheating on each other. Like, what's the difference? I don't understand. Like, it, it's people going for these things because of what they think it looks like or they think is going on. Versus something over here that might actually benefit you. But you have this fear of what everybody else is going to think. See, that guilt and that regret, we got to get, we got to, that's the things we have to eliminate. Like. What other people think about you is not your business, especially if they don't tell you. It's none of your business. Like, allow them to think that. Allow them to do that. But too many of our relationships is dictated by us trying to play chess with the other. Like, there's no trust there. <laughs> Y'all don't trust each other. Yeah, and, 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 and when it comes to, and, and people think I'm, I'm just this big old liar based off of my occupation of 20-some years. Uh -huh. But... I, I really stand on that, man. Like anybody that I've been in a relationship with, I never like physically cheated on them. You know what I'm saying? It was just, I, like I said, I had to go through a, a, an emotional cheating stint. But as far as really going out there and doing the do and stuff like that, I, I never did nothing like that because I always empathize. I'm like, man, this would kill me if, if, if she did this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I'm the type of person that, you know, 
and and maybe that's still selfish in a way with me, Tim, is because it's not that I'm not cheating because I care about the other person. I'm really like, well, I wouldn't want this shit done to me. So yeah, yeah, I would. It's the empath in you, <laughs> but I, but it, but it takes it takes that level of mental to get through a lot of shit. You know what I mean? I yeah. think it's the narcissist in me that I don't care if I get cheated on. You know, because hell, I'm looking at it. It's, it's your loss. Like you a dummy, you gonna cheat on me? Especially this nigga that ain't about to do half the shit I'm willing to do for you, and put up with your shit, and talk to you, and actually like you. Motherfucker, <laughs> just lust after. They're just interested in you. I've already accepted, like, we gonna be together. So if you cheat on me, why would I be upset or hurt? Like, you missing out. You know what I mean? You make bad life choices. Like, a part of that is narcissism, I feel like. And I think that that is a breeding ground for a lot of the mentality nowadays is that people really are not looking for things on a deeper level. And because, you know, sometimes people are now bonding together because it looks good to say that I'm in a relationship but then they have this whole tribe over here that wants to kick it and, and, and live the city girl life and live the city boy life. And, and really, it's conflicting of the two because, I mean, either you're going to be in a relationship and you're going to have your own set of rules and your creed and goals that you're going to move forward to. And you're going to forsake this tribe that kind of wants you to go out here and, you know, what I'm saying, wild out and do things that's going to disrupt your home life. Or you're going to just say, hey, you know what? I'm still living this life right here. So, you know, I know that you're a really dope person, but let me let you go and find somebody that can be what you need them to be. But people are not willing to make that choice. They want the security of a relationship while they still want to do things that can disrupt their home. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and, and I think it's behind this whole agenda that sex is the only way you can cheat. Like, Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> I think it's the most glorified. It's the most, you know, common for what people see in movies, what people see in the media. But in real life, nah, to me, any level of affection, any level of these deeper levels you unlock with people, if other people got access to that, like, that's a form of cheating. Yeah. You know what I mean? Telling other people, like, y'all's plans, y'all actual is internal structure, like, that's cheating. Yeah, Dang, like I don't understand how people consider that not cheating. That's Man, cheating because if you don't have loyalty to something, you're not loyal to anything. Yeah, Dang. and 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 I've seen that too. Like, well, your wife told me this, or your 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 man told oh, me. Oh yeah, I'm... and some <laughs> and some stuff like, yo, why would you tell? This? I'm blowing up on everybody. Some shit like that happened to me. That's <laughs> never happened to me. Why would you tell this person about our home life? Like, what the hell is You seen The Woman King? Huh? You seen The Woman King? I have no, I, I have not. I've, Man, I've, go watch The Woman King. So the so the, the king in the movie has like seven wives. So it's these Spanish people coming to try to, they're in the slave trade and they're doing business. So yeah. one of the younger wives is talking to the guys about the king's business. Oh, boy, it goes off <laughs> like <laughs> don't you ever and he had to check dude first because he's trying to address him about what the wife said so he's just laughing as he's saying like yeah one of your wives said y'all do it da, da, da. he said listen <laughs> i'm gonna talk to her about that later he said you don't discuss me and my wife's business like this ain't that you know what i mean and dude's still trying to go like oh i'm sorry but still trying to go he said what did i say like <laughs> either we're gonna talk about something else so y'all can get the fuck out like this is that, that's the ultimate sign of disrespect to me. Like, there ain't no way. Yeah, after after a certain, like, bond, like, when you're dating, okay, of course, there there's a level that you can find in your best friend or whatever, because you, you kind of want to know how to navigate if you're overthinking and stuff like that. Yeah. Once, once you become bonded, let's say you're living in the same hut together or you've decided to plan a life together, your life is your life. You know what I'm saying? And so, therefore, even telling your girlfriends, even talking to, you know, if, if you need to talk to somebody, talk to a goddamn therapist. You know exactly. What I mean? you, or, or talk to somebody that's objective, but not somebody exactly. that if you guys fall out, you know, now you done told all your business to, to this, your work husband or your best friend. Now they can go and be like, oh, yeah, that's why, you know what I'm saying? He ain't giving it to you right. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> That's some wild shit. That's betrayal beyond betrayal. Yeah. <laughs> you fall out at any time. 
And next thing you know how messy that is. Like, yo, that's why I said. And, 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 and this is why I, I feel like just bonds and relationships right now are superficial. And, and it is about dominance versus subordinate. And when I say this, it's not like, you know, women or men have the mentality of like, I'm going to dominate over this person. They're just seeing how much they can extract from this person and, and, and give as little to that person as possible. And, and, and what's so sad is people are doing it subconsciously. They're not doing it purposely, but we're bringing, we're bringing people to be that way. It's like, let me see how much I can extract from this person with little exchange. And that's sad, man. Yeah, it's that, and I hate the term work husband and work wife. I cringe when I see even people joke about shit like that because I know all these jokes ain't jokes. But for me, it's it's further proving y'all don't have any trust. Y'all don't have any real dynamic. The fact that you need a safety net. The fact that you need all these safe words and you need this shit to get out. <laughs> y'all don't trust each other. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, those are the healthiest marriages I've ever seen. The old people yelling at each other in the park like, because y'all don't know how they are at home. Don't take this one instance and think they don't like each other. And then you got the couple that's all over each other and think they in love. Yeah. Don't none of this work like that. <laughs> you dig? You need the people who are going to be real with you. You need Man. the people who are going to have your best interest. That's what I look for in a wife. Like, can you still love me when you mad? And I mean mad at me. You know what I mean? You upset. You fuming. Can you still look at me the same? Or is your first instinct to try to tear me down or bring up my insecurities? Or go gossip about my shit to somebody else. Because that's just showing our connection. That's showing my value in your life. You dig? So we see it. We know you hit the, hell, the nail on the head. A lot of these relationships are superficial for the fact no other people don't want to get hurt anymore. But there is no love without that. Like, that's the definition of love to me. It's a lot giving somebody the ability to hurt you and trusting that they won't. It's, a, it's a being vulnerable with them, but not fearful that they're going to stab you in the back. You know what I mean? That's love. And you know what's been a common thread that's also sickening is that sometimes the business is being put out there as a double down or insurance in case something goes wrong is that, you know, the narrative right now is that you're the problem. Nobody wants the accountability of being the problem. So what a lot of spouses are doing is planting the seed and doubling down like if this does go wrong, nobody wants to look like the bad person. So they're they're planting seeds like, oh, they do this and they do that or they do this and the other. And it's very sick how people just yeah. are planting seeds to the public about. And, and, and guess what? You become an enemy at that point. You know what I'm saying? Because oh, yeah. a creed or like you said. You look at any secret society, the mafia, the gangs, or anything like that, they have a code that they follow. And one of them codes is mm -mm, we keep we keep our business in-house. You know what I'm saying? But what you see in a lot of these relationships, man, is that you know, I don't want people to think that I'm the problem. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's just sad, man. They worried about what other people think. But I just I have to look at the world logically. You know what I mean? If me and one person has an issue, it's going to be easiest for us to dissolve that issue. Once you get five other people, this thing done went out of control. This thing is damn near unfixable now because they've all added their flavor to the story. They've all added their bias to the story. They've all picked the side. All of that is going against finding a solution. So again, if you're having these issues in your relationship, ask yourself, is your relationship looking for solutions? Are looking for more problems. <laughs> and listen, or, or are you looking for solutions, or are you looking for people to say that you're right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because love, love, and relationships ain't about being right. This, this is where we could take a page out the old heads book. You know, they had it all figured out when it comes to these kind of things. They wasn't trying to one up their wife. They wasn't trying to be an alpha male at home. They knew what they was in the streets. They was yeah. able to be a kitten and vulnerable at home, you dig? And that's what most <laughs> men want. That's what most men want, but they don't have the balls to say that's what they want because one of their homies is going to seem unfavorable. You know what I mean? Like, everybody ain't going to be happy with you. Everybody ain't going to agree with what you're doing. But if you got that person at home that's really behind your back, like, I wouldn't sacrifice that for anything out there, any of these promises, any of these phishing emails. Yo, you looking for a wife? Like, 
nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. And and that builds up your security in yourself by standing on your choices. But it's too many people, you know what I mean? Y'all in an argument, and now you entertaining your inbox. Like that's that's not the way. You know, and, and this is what I'm saying is that there are numerous of ways that relationships can work. There's nothing wrong with 50-50 as long as there's reciprocation. 50-50 is great. If if there's somebody that is the leader and and, and uh they're doing the majority of the work, let's just say that at least you can be the help to keep them going. You know what I'm saying? Don't be the obstacle or the distraction. So in a household, and I'm only using gender roles specific to create an example, in a household where the man does all the work, making sure that his dinner and breakfast and stuff like that is not just being, oh, I'm a slave or anything like that. It's just like, hey, man, you got to be a warrior out here. I don't want you to have war when it comes in this house. You know what I'm saying? I want you to have a, a place of peace so I can recharge you to get back out there and be the warrior. Now, if it's a 50-50 relationship, we both have our chance to be the warrior, but let's go ahead and interchange this. If, if, if you're working in the daytime, let me make sure that the house is quiet. I'm sorry, if you're working overnight, let me make sure the house is quiet for you in the daytime. If you're working all day, let me make sure that your dinner and everything is, is, is straight for you when you come home to a place of peace. So it's all about that, that, that balance, you know what I'm saying? People just yeah. think, I'm the man and you're the woman, and they place it in gender roles. No, it's just roles, roles that you're playing to get the machine to work. You know, like like you said, as long as I knew, if I knew that I wouldn't be disrespected and I wouldn't be emasculated, I wouldn't mind being a Stedman fucking Graham. I would be a Stedman Graham. I don't give a damn. Yeah. Yes, my wife is a billionaire, and I have to do shit if I don't want to. <laughs> but guess what? When Oprah comes home, then I'm going to have five oils for her feet. Boom, 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 yeah. boom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have that bubble bath ready. I'm going to have that massage table like Mr. Miyagi on his mother. Boom, you know what I'm saying? Me? <laughs> because <laughs> she's making a life affordable for me not to do shit. You hear yeah. me? But, but as long as she doesn't emasculate me or do none of that bullshit we can have a happy life together which is where i feel like why we don't see a lot of house and stay-at-home husbands and it's not this is what society always gets to blame and a lot of times it's your household <laughs> whether you love your parents and don't want to blame them it's them whether you love your spouse and don't want to blame them it's them whether you love your kids <laughs> and don't want to blame them it's them it's your household. So a lot of these house husbands were being demasculated by these women verbally. You know what yeah. I mean? And oh, you ain't no real man. All that bullshit. So yeah, it's hard to live in that type of environment of something you love when you're being constantly torn down. But most men, we would love that gig because we're here to be helpful. We're here to serve. We want to make your life easier. So that is not a calling card saying you need to do all these things for my life. You dig? The two are not synonymous. Yeah. The two that are synonymous is the two P's. Either you my peace or you my problem. So how you become my peace is by not becoming my problem. It's not by doing these 10 things you think I would need every day. No, it's don't be a fucking problem. <laughs> and then that's how you are my peace. It's that simple. I don't need all this extra shit. I, I can do that shit for myself. Those aren't things that men require. We're trying to help you. Like you said, yo, you worked all night. You up early. I'm trying to make sure the kids is quiet. And are they still laying down? Or I just take them food to the room so they ain't coming in here bothering you. I'm making sure everything that they would come to you to do is already done. So now they can look up and don't even know what to do. Like, shit, I usually ask mom about this. Yeah. I'm being your peace. I didn't have to do nothing to you directly. I didn't have to say shit to you. You were asleep. I created an environment to where you are not disturbed. That's what the man wants. Sometimes we just want to come home and tell you how fucking shitty the world is and how harsh it is, and I want to burn all this shit down. Listen, you know what I, mean? I don't want you talking me off the ledge. Just let me, let me, let me do what I'm doing. Can I, can I do a this is Facebook moment? Yes. <laughs> Facebook. Nobody should know that you make more money than your husband. Nobody, Nobody should know, know this. Nobody should know. Because that's the only way that they know is if you told them. 
That's messy. Nobody should know that you. So, so therefore, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, Tim. It's like as long as nobody knows your business, you can run your household the way that you want to. This is Facebook. Nobody needs to know that your husband is is a Mr. Mom. There's no right. why nobody should know this. <laughs> you call it a Miss Doubtfire and shit. We know yeah, we yeah. get the jokes, man. That we don't want it. No, that when you show up for church, you know what I'm saying. You suited and booted, she is too. When you show up to these functions, y'all happy as hell. You know what I'm saying? Because I can be Mr. Mom, but goddamn it, I got an AK-47 in my closet. So if you try to come in here, oh, you gonna see the man now. I can do the dishes. I can bring home the bacon fried in the pan. But you try to come in this house, brrr, I'm lighting your ass up. Yeah, Mr. Mom, that. Hey. <laughs> 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 but listen, that's this is why on social media, you know, I take the stance I take. This is why I try to, I try to speak for the, the brothers who don't have no voice, man. This is those posts. You know, as far as men, like, when I said, you know, after the argument, we got to check your page to see what you said. Like, that shit is very real. Yeah. I see too many fucking times a paragraph on here, you telling us about your household that we should not know. 98% of this, we should know. Like, you could have wrote this in a notebook. You might have to put this on your wall, but you hit the nail on the head. You're trying to be right. I'm not trying to be right in my relationship. You dig what I'm saying? I'm trying to be on time. I'm you're trying to trying, be present. But you're trying to double down. That way, if, if he walks out of my life, I can make him the bad guy. Exactly. I bad guy. I don't have to deal with the PTSD of a breakup. You right. know what I mean? But that, to me, again, you're breaking up for the wrong intentions. Breakup should be peaceful. This shouldn't be this war zone. Shit, you moving on to what's for you. What's, what the hell is wrong with that? I would never demonize a person for that. You know what I mean? I can get how your feelings are stung. You're emotionally unstable. Cool. Go to Miami. Go enjoy yourself. Go do what you like to do. Right. But at the end of the day, there's no part of me that can say, I care about you. I love you. I have your best interest. I'm the problem. And then I get upset when you want to leave. Like, that. Don't, none of that makes sense to me. To me, as a human being, I want you to do what's best for you, even if I'm not a part of that version. And, and let me tell you something. Breakups don't even have to be financially disastrous either. You know what I'm saying? If, if both are civilized and fair, you know, if you have children involved, you do whatever is best for the children. If you don't have any children involved, and you know what I'm saying, then you just start splitting things down the middle of what you own and this, that, and the other. But what happens is people want compensation for a broken heart. So this is why they want to go in people's inboxes and, and besmirch your name and besmirch your reputation because they want the compensation for a broken heart. They want you to pay that you no longer want to be in a relationship with them. You know what I'm saying? They want you to feel that pain. So this is why things get ugly and things get petty is because at the end of this verbal contract or the social contract, Somebody didn't fulfill it, or basically we're at the re renegotiation part of this social uh, contract, and this relationship no longer serves me. There's nobody, nobody's bad for that. You know what I'm saying? Right. At this point, this relation, I'm going here, and this relationship no longer serves me. So, am I going to be the empath and 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 not open up that door to my freedom and say, you know what? At least I stayed. There are a lot of bitter wives that should have left 20 years ago. Yeah. There are a lot of bitter employees that should have left that job to open up their business 20 years ago. But they wanted everybody, well, he's been on his job 30 years, and you got a fucking pin. You got a fucking $200 watch that you could have bought with your bonus check. You got a $200 watch for this job for 30 years. You don't get a part of any corporate sharing any 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 profit sharing, none of that. You know, they cut your benefits in half, but you got a $200 watch because you've been on the job 30 years. Good for you. You know what I'm saying? But now, the 20 years or 10 years of some people say, psychologists say, you only live five years after retirement. So after them five years of retirement, you live in regret and said, man, that art business, I could have I could have opened up that art business. Yeah. I could have opened up that, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, I could have been with somebody that would have would have really gave me what I wanted. Mm. I could have really been, or fuck somebody giving it to you. I could have really gotten into myself 
and loved myself for these 20 years when this person just depleted me over and over mm -hmm. again. So this is what I'm saying is that the empath versus the narcissist, I'm not saying one is bad or the other, but nine times out of 10, guess what? Narcissists get what they want and narcissists don't regret shit. Yeah. They, they, That's I, why people hate them so much because they're doing what other people want to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why it's such a, a negatively coined term. Like, because I think you need a little bit of both. You know what I mean? You need a little bit of both inside of what you're doing, inside of who you are. And a lot of times people are waiting to that big test to be the moment. They're waiting to that moment in their relationship where, all right, I got to trust my ability to walk. You should have been walking a long time ago. When I was younger and I would enter a room where they talking shit about me, I'm walking out. When I'm in a job and they not treating me respectfully, I'm walking out. When I'm in a friendship and you don't value me, I'm walking. I've been walking out my whole life. So now I get to this relationship. Oh, this is a piece of cake. This isn't the first time I've had to walk out of something that was unfavorable. You dig? So that's the journey in life. We always have time to work on it. You know what I mean? So when you get in that type of relationship and you get in that type of breakup, there's only one medicine for it. You know, the OGs had it right. You got to hold that L. <laughs> like... You got to hold that fucking hell. You got to go lick your wounds and get back up on that horse. But the longer you dwell on it, the harder it's going to be to move on. What you put off to tomorrow is going to be harder than what you need to do today. Like, hold that L. And that L can be a lesson or it can be a loss because you could have been the fucked up one in the relationship. So you're losing a good person. Or you were being taken for granted. So you got a lesson now. You see everybody ain't got your heart. You see, yeah. everybody ain't got your resilience when it comes to keeping a relationship going. And that's okay. See, now your grace and growth is learning to love them anyway. But learning to love them is not forgiving. And it's not forgetting and it's not taking them back. You dig? I can love you from over there. Because I have to love me first. I have to pour into my cup first. You dig? So now we start to see we're getting into these issues relationship-wise because we ain't looking out for ourselves. And so, no, even if you've waited 10 years, it's not bad that you want to look out for yourself today. It's never too late to start. You can restart as many times as you need to in life and change your mindset and change your process and your habits. You dig? Stop letting society say it's too late or you're too old. That's bullshit. People change their lives every day. You dig? And, and, and there's a certain point where you have to see the future in anything, the job, the relationship, the family. And as Tim said, and, and I love these conversations because each conversation is intertwined. Mm -hmm. When you see the future in it and you see the possibility or what we call the potential of anything, that's the grace that Tim was talking about. That mm -hmm. is the grace. But once you made a decision, you at that point said there is no more grace because I no longer see my happiness. I no longer see the benefit. I no longer see the situation serving me to where it's going to get me to where I want to go. So the grace was the potential, as Tim so eloquently put. That's the grace is, okay, this may not be where I want it, but I'm going I'm to I'm I'm give it a little bit more time. I'm going to give it so I can see, so I can get all of the information. But once that person, as Tim said, decides to leave, you can't look all shocked and be like, Oh my, you can't give me any grace. The grace was given with the potential. <laughs> yeah. Not with the decision. For sometimes the first chance is your second chance. You don't always get a second chance, especially now with people like me. You know what I mean? You don't always get a second chance. So it's like, let's get this right. I was just having this conversation the other day and I had to learn this lesson through these, these journeys. You know what I mean? But I learned hating somebody is not the worst thing that you can do to them. You dig? And love is not the opposite of hate. Hate is just misguided love. And love is the best thing you can do for somebody. So the worst thing you can do for somebody is indifference, is you just don't feel a way about them all. And people do not know what to do with that. You know what I mean? But to protect my peace, sometimes that was the only grace I could give you. Sometimes that was the only mercy I had. And I'm not trying to be a merciful person. If this was back in the day, I would be considered a tyrant. <laughs> you dig? I'm not trying to be merciful. You know what I mean? Like, the mercy is the fact that we ain't came and conquered you sooner. That was my mercy, is that I took a nap first. 
you should have packed your shit and been out because I told you what was going to happen and you called my bluff. So here we are, you dig? But yeah. in this new day and age, obviously, we can't it, we can't live like that anymore. So we need more grace. We had to give more people more chances. and But people taking advantage of that. They starting to take our kindness for weakness. So now right. we had a we had an impasse as us givers, as us empaths. What do we do? Do we keep being a doormat? Or do we lock the door? <laughs> be, be, because, like, I know some people, and this is what Dame Dash said, <clears throat> you can find your purpose in the job. If your purpose is leadership and you went to whatever bank, bank USA, so-and-so, and you rose up to, you know, the, the executive's position and you're happy, that's what you were called to do. We yeah. need people that govern these banks. We need people that run the post office. We need people who rose to foreman at this construction site or at, at the trash company or, you know what I'm saying, what, what, what do you call these? Uh, I forget. Um, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. But um, the local, I, they call it local 495 or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Okay. We need people, I know some of people, union, that's what I'm going to say. Okay. We need people in these union and these trades and these plumbers and all this stuff like that. And these people really take to be an electrician and a plumbing. But if you're plumbing to pay the bills, but you're really an artist, you need to be planning your exit plan yeah. every single day because while plumbing pays the bills, you're depleting yourself every time you go to that job. You're depleting who you who you were put on this earth to be. There's nothing wrong with a job, but every single day. So that that leads to um, what Alicia, Dr. Alicia Jones said, and I'm, I'm really good friends with her. But she said, should men be dating if they are not fulfilling their purpose or they're broke? And I said, even in the red pill community says no. No, you should absolutely not be pursuing a relationship while you are in pursuit of your purpose. And the reason being is because relationships require a lot of compromise. So therefore, if you're working a job, you still have to find time to, 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 to own your craft. You still have to find time in that to make sure that you're mastering your craft. There's no room for a relationship at that point. You know what I'm saying? Because you have to do too much compromising. But if that part, the, I said the only exception is, is if the person that's coming into your life is helping you move forward with that. And they're willing to lower themselves and their needs and a lot of things that, but most most relationships ain't willing to do that shit. You, you go hard eight hours at a job and then you spend four hours trying to do your purpose. Nine times out of 10, you're going to hear you here. We don't spend enough time with me. We don't never go out anymore. We don't yeah. never. Before you speak, yeah. I'm gonna tell you this last story of how this this situation works. So before you rebuttal, ladies, there was a man and his is he goes by his government name was Tracy Barrow, and he was basically a, a Los Angeles crip. Now he was also a drug dealer, and this was in the. 60s, 70s, and 80s, and he was also a pimp. And he had this fine, fine woman. I'm talking about bad. She was cold. And in the early 80s, about 81, 82, he said, Darlene, give me three years. Give me at least three years. We're not going to go out to eat. We're not going to go out and do anything. But I promise you, if you give me these three years, I will give you the world. Now, if I said Darlene, you should know exactly who I'm talking about. That rapper's name was Ice T. Mm -hmm. Convince his woman for three years, let's save our money and do nothing but let me do this right here. She did that. And even though they are not together today, Darlene is sitting like a fat rat. She's still reaping the benefits of that decision that he made. So that's why I said the only exception is if you are willing to fully aid this person in their purpose and i promise you you'll reap the benefit so i love that you broke it into two parts i 100 percent agree with what you're saying um in a perfect world yes people would be able to balance both in a practical world most people can't most people can't balance all their children 
So, no, I don't think you should be focused on a relationship while you're building yourself because that's not where you go to build yourself. You should. But that's the thing to where us as people, we try to take shortcuts. You know what I mean? Because I also feel like you shouldn't be going out <laughs> or getting drunk or celebrating because what the hell you celebrate? <laughs> I think your whole life should be working on what you're trying to do. So. Yeah. If we can find an exclusion for the relationship, there's a whole lot of other shit we need to start excluding as well, not just the relationship up front. But I do agree on the other side. There's some people who can balance both, almost that that's what they need in that point of their healing journey. You know what I mean? There's a lot of beautiful success stories, and, and that's what I look for for myself. But I definitely understand most people, it won't go that way because you have to actually assess and process what you're trying to do. Now, there is this third way that a lot of people don't find favorable, but shit, why not? Where two people can come together and decide not to be together, but also we're both going to be single right now and get and get ourselves, work on ourselves, and then we'll come back together and be together. So mm -hmm. me telling you I don't want to be with you now be single is not saying go jump in a relationship, and I'm not going to go jump in a relationship. We're going to really work on ourselves, you know what I mean, separately but together. So then I think that makes that union stronger, maybe even being friends during that time. And it's a lot of shit we don't put on the table because people want what they want right now. <laughs> and they're not caring who they need to step on to get it. But it, it, it it's turning out now we're resenting and regretting a lot of things we have because of how we had to get it. You know what I mean? You can't be happy with your husband because you took him from sus. <laughs> so it's like now when we start doing these things intentionally on our own we'll learn how to do them together in a group you know what i mean and that takes time no relationship is built over a weekend or because y'all have similar interests y'all have to see each other each season in multiple of those seasons you dig and then come down and delegate mutually does this still make sense for both of us because then you have each other's best interests but as long as you're looking for self and going for self, you might as well be single. You don't right. need to get in no relationship to be single. Like you can do all of that shit by yourself. Now you just you want to tag along. You want a buddy with you. Right. That's not what your spouse is there for. <laughs> and, and and this is why in anything, you should have a journal, a ledger, and 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 that that what do you call it, that vision board. You know that that and the reason being is because you always have to keep that go we, we we operate on autopilot so much and 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 it's, it's it's natural for us to operate on autopilot because now we can look at life as a wish factor like you know i really would like to you know live out in the suburbs and i really would like to have this type of lifestyle but as long as we stay on autopilot we don't have to put the work and to do that, we could just keep life in a wish factor. But the minute that we put that life on a ledger, the minute we put life on a budget, the minute we put life on a sacrifice, and we, like you said, talk about the things that we want. And people, we're not just talking about relationships, we're talking about these social contracts that you have with everyone. Yeah. When you put these things on a ledger, when you put these things in a journal, you can say, when things are going off track, well, this is the goal. This is what's going to take us from the goal. If we're out here partying, if we're out here constantly drinking and, and doing all these kind of things, uh, you say you want to lose weight, but we still sneaking ho hos and exactly. shit. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? You can't do both. You can't sneak the ho hos and still drop 20 pounds before the summer. It's not going to work. So, mm -hmm. therefore, when we set this ledger, and, and, but people are afraid of that conversation. I don't want to talk about money. Why not? <laughs> I don't want to talk about the things you did for me. Why not? Because because I'm fulfilling my end of the social contract and you're not. Um, mm. <laughs> right, right. <Yeah. laughs> I don't I don't want to talk about you know what I'm saying the problem. Why? Because is, does that mean that we actually have to fix it? We actually have to address it. You know what I'm saying? This is where you start the healing. This is where you start to start. Yeah. To off these goals when you say okay we're getting off track it's not complaining it's say hey we're getting off track <laughs> let's 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 bring this back what are we doing to, to get us off track are you willing to give this up because if not as tim so eloquently said then i gotta head this way because i told you i was heading this way but everything that we're doing is keeping us from going this way 
And I don't think people really want to deal with that and look at that hard, in, in a hard light. Yeah, and that's what it takes to make the relationship work. That's It's the only way, any type of relationship. It feeds into, you know, what we were talking about, do you want somebody to come to you healed or do you want them to heal with you? You know what I mean? Which is an interesting topic, you dig? And I say it's interesting because it depends on the two people. It can always work. Once things are fucked up, it can always work. Once things have been good in the beginning, it can always work, you dig? It depends on what y'all are trying to do with each other. So y'all have to move forward. That's why a lot of relationships fail and then die because people can't get over what happened or they are trying to beat you over the head with who they feel you were. You dig? Like, this is why, again, I don't really push the whole forgiveness of other people. I just need you to understand who I am and not try to fucking wring me out to dry with it. You dig? So if a man cheats on you and you're ready to move forward, there needs to be no conversations of, yeah, you used to be a cheater. Or remember that time you cheated? You dig what I'm saying? This is the fucking problem. If you ain't forgave them, leave. But don't beat them over the head with what you feel like they did wrong and you're choosing to stay. Like, now you're making it impossible for them to grow and to love you because they're just starting to resent you more and more and more every single time you bring up their flaws. Yeah. You know, and why would a person do that? It's because you're insecure about your flaws. Like, you have to deal with all that before getting into a relationship. A relationship's not going to make you feel secure. It's going to make you feel more insecure than secure. You have to make yourself feel secure with what you know to be true. And don't be mad because you took on the role of dependent. Because human nature will also say what you allow will continue. So mm -hmm. when you take on the role that says... You cheated on me, but I'm depending on you for my emotional work. I'm depending on you for my financial work. So I'm going to I'm going to try to forgive you, or I'm going to try to allow you back into my life. Basically, you took on that role. So, like you said, you can't condemn that person at that point because hey, now I'm I'm, I'm I put myself in the codependent role. So if yeah. it again or anything like that, you chose to stay. It psychologically happens between women and men every freaking day. You know what I mean? And this is game like I consider myself a real person because I'm going to give people advice. You know, if I know there's a hole forward and you about to walk, I'm going to give you a heads up. Like, bro, it's a hole. You might want to, you know what I mean? Be careful. So when we were younger, I always did this with my sisters, my best friend who were women, like, I had to start explaining to them how a man's mind works. <laughs> Just because men go along with it don't mean they're okay with it. You dig? So there's a lot of women out here trying to impress men by sleeping with them on the first night. You dig? And he's going to respect you more if you tell him no. He might give you a weird-ass reaction, but in his head, he's like, okay, I would marry her. But the fact is you thinking you getting his allegiance by sleeping with him is actually doing the opposite. Now it's hard for him to trust you because all in his head is he thinking is this is what you'll do with anybody. So I don't want somebody like that. I want somebody who I'm throwing my best game at her. And she's just like, no, <laughs> nah, because now I can associate. This is probably how you are with men. You dig? So it would seem like men want easy girls. Yeah, they want to have fun with you, but they don't want to keep nobody like that. You know what I mean? I was seeing a discussion on the show. They was talking about that. Like, should a woman be worried if a man's in a relationship with her and he starts liking another girl? You know what I mean? Shout out to the homie Trip Fontaine. He was talking about this on the pod they be doing. And he was just saying, like, no. He's like, do you really think that man's going to leave that woman at home because he likes you? Why, why would I? Because you brought yourself in this situation thinking you can slide in the middle of us and you're okay with just living around what you think I need. You're not even trying to give me everything. So, and, yeah, I like you, <laughs> but I'm not leaving her. He said, I'm about to marry her. This is where I want to be. But, yeah, I'll text you. I'll comment on your shit and giggle. But she really knows me. She really <laughs> The twist was when he said, yes, I like you. I like that you choose to be in a position. I like you better right now because you <laughs> Position that doesn't require me to do anything. Yes, I like you better, but I'm not leaving her. And that's bars. That's, that's, Bars. Because that's all you wanted. 
She wants everything out of me. She want to be at the end of my life. She want to be a part of my legacy. You just wanted me to like you. So why would you think that I would be attracted to something like that? Which goes to show you don't know me. The fact that you thought you can come here and take me from this woman, do you know who we've been through? <laughs> you, 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 like, what? That's a perfect segue. Um, you have to understand what people want in these social contracts. If sometimes when you're not getting what you want from the other person is that they feel like they haven't received what they needed to, to release that. You know what I'm saying? And these things may take time. Uh, it's nothing wrong with a, a social exchange. It's nothing wrong with an exchange within these social contracts. We both have to be fulfilled. So if you see some deficiency in the home, you have to uncover why that deficiency is there. You know what I'm saying? Especially if you've been used to a certain thing for a certain amount of time and you see that it's, it's I mean, people, the natural thing is people do get comfortable. We, we talked about jobs. We talked about jobs earlier, you know, before you were coming into work on time. But, you know, after year three, it's like, fuck that job. You know what I'm saying? Because that comfortability has set in. Um, you no longer have to work to get that check or, you know what I'm saying? You have to beat everybody out to, to get that job or what have you. So you have to understand that comfortability has its place and it has its grace. It has its place and it has its grace. But at the end of the day, you have to check that and see what your worker morale is, your spouse morale is, your household morale is. And if you have to do damage control and things of that nature, you have to not be blind and have blinders on when you're trying to get those goals. Because, you know, if you're in a hut together, anything could cause you to be pulled away from those goals. So what I'm saying is that give time, give grace. But then after and, and give communication. But then after a while, if these things don't return back or they don't get better, then you have all the justification in the world. And when it comes to the empath, you don't have to feel guilty about leaving. <laughs> when it comes to the narcissist, you're never going to feel guilty about leaving. Yeah. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, neither one is a bad thing. I just I favor the empath because the empath does stay too long. The empath does give more than they get back. The empath does bite its tongue and takes the higher road more than the narcissist. So I always favor the empath, the empath to be stronger, to be wiser, to be yeah. assertive, because you can be an empath and be all three of these things, but more often than not, the empath always gets depleted because they put other people's needs before them. Yeah. And the narcissist has their similar battles. You know what I mean? They're just more so facing delusion. And this was something I had, I was dealing with more on the narcissistic side when I was younger. You think someone's life's going to fall apart because you leave it. Like, that's a narcissist. You know what I mean? You think it's only going to rain in their life now because you ain't there no more with the umbrella. <laughs> you ain't bringing the sunshine. And that's that's not fair to them because that's making it seem like we're the only good thing that was happening in their life. And a lot of times... It's hard not to feel that when someone's just constantly dumping on themselves or telling you only negative shit about themselves. You're like, oh, shit, like, I must be a good thing going on in your life. You know what I mean? So then people start trying to use that as manipulation. Like, oh, well, I'm going to take away all my goodness and I'm going to take away all my energy. You dig? Like, we can only worry about ourselves at the end of the day. We can only make sure we're good. But your family, I feel like, is an extension of trying to make sure you're good. Your family has that same intention that you have when it comes to your peace, when it comes to your education, you know what I mean? When it comes to your quality of life. And too many times we come into these situations already with our guard up. Somebody's hurt us in the past, so we just don't want to be hurt no more. Like, love is just releasing all that. It's starting over from a clean slate. Delane is not my cousin that he looks like that hurt me 20 years ago. So I don't get to treat you how he treated me. I don't get to come in with my guard up and expect you to do what he did. That's not fair to you. You dig what I'm saying? And we all do that. Men and women, young and old, we all do that. We're so afraid to get hurt. We just project what's easiest for us to look at. You dig? I want to go the hard route because I know if we can get through this shit now, you feel me? We don't have nothing to worry about later. That's why I want to build my love while I build myself because if it was a competition, I want her to see me have nothing and build my way up. I want her to see me be an asshole and turn into a gentleman. 
You mm-hmm. dig what I'm saying? I want to see her to see me not give a fuck about these kids to being a great father. Mm-hmm. I want that memory of me in your head. So when it comes to our 10th year and you having trouble loving me, you can fall back on that. When it comes to this man that you upset with me and you like the attention you get, you can bounce back on our foundation. You dig? We have those things set in place. And sometimes relationships are going left because they both too comfortable. They both are healed and financially well. So they don't really need each other in their minds. You know what I mean? But it's a different relationship when y'all can identify like we need each other. I'm not mm-hmm. here because I don't want to be over there. I'm not here because you're like my mom. I'm here for you and you're here for me. So let's work with that. And we're not going to find that through anybody else. You mm-hmm. dig? So I think that's just giving you a sturdy foundation because the more you build any tower, the, the bottom gets wobbly. <laughs> it starts to sway <laughs> a little bit. It ain't as strong as a foundation no more, but you got to keep building. You got to keep building and keep building and just trust it's going to hold together. That was a dope analogy, man. This was a dope conversation. Yes, sir. Hey, bro. Man, that was a way to bring this home, man. Hey. <laughs> One more time, man. Good Life Ohio, Tim Russ, man. This was this was a dope conversation, man. And I, like I said, I love how we, we start on things, we can go all the way to Cincinnati, <laughs> bring it back to Dayton, Ohio, man. It's, 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 I love the journey that we take each and every single week, Tim. It, it's, it's dope. Man. I love the listeners. Yeah, same. And, and this is what is imperative people know. Like, this is life shit. You know what I mean? I don't ever come on here to knock nobody, just give perspective. Like, and shout out to all the brothers that's doing what we do, but we not here for the gossip. I'm not here to talk about celebrity relationships. I'm not here to talk about none of that nonsense. Like, we talking about real life shit. We talking about stuff that if you get old in age and you like, man, what can I leave behind my kids? Leave them behind this. Get them hip to this show. Like, give them some game. That's the best thing we can do for each other. We got to educate each other and stop being so judgmental about shit we can't even control. Man, that's my final word. Uh, reading... Uh, not only watching Bridgerton, I, I, I encourage people to watch Bridgerton. Please do. Fire show. Fire. Yeah. I'm so glad you watched that. That's my stuff. Man, it's got a lot of social cues uh, that we, we deal with today, but they had, they were they were wise. They were very wise on how to deal with these social cues, man. So if you haven't watched Bridgerton, but one of those parts that Tim has been saying as a theme throughout this entire show, but uh, Lady Danby had said to uh, Miss Sharma, she had said, uh, the minute you try to control somebody else's outcome, it makes you a worse person of who you are. You become a worse person because you're trying to control the dynamic. You're constantly trying. So then you become manipulative. It makes you that much worse of a person the minute you try to control who somebody is. The best thing to do is allow that person to be who they are and then make certain decisions around that or make a decision on how to deal with that person or strategize how you're going to protect yourself. But the minute you try to force change, you become the, the, the bad person at that point. So you really have to allow the decisions to be made. You can only communicate what you want and what you don't want. But at the end of the day, once you see that person is listening to you, effectively doing certain things to you know at least help the situation, at least you know you stand, where you stand with that person. If not, as I stated before, if it's not reciprocated, it must be eliminated. And that's all I got to say. That's real, man. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with everything you said today. And, yeah, this was a powerful show. I, I think they're getting better. Absolutely, man. Join us next week, and we'll do it all over again. Uh, tonight, I will be at Double Take. Double Take, uh, right there on Whittier and High Street for the Carousel Experience. Uh, I want to thank all of our listeners, Adrian, Jessica, Dre, Andrea. I know my baby was going to check in initially at the start of the show. Uh, who else is going to check in? Hey, Michelle, I know she pops in from time to time. And uh, D.L. Carey for sharing this on our page. Uh, again, if you haven't shared this already, please share it. You can come back over all of our listeners. who didn't catch the live, you can go back. It's on my page, on the Uptown Show page as well. Tim, give them uh, your books real quick before we get out of here. 
Yes, sir. Uh, Good Life Russ on Amazon. I got five books out, two dropping June 26th. Make sure y'all pull up June 22nd to uh, Speech Therapy's back. That's my open mic show I do where we feature brands, businesses, and artists. And artists, excuse me. So follow me everywhere. Good life for us. We got a lot of dope things coming this summer. And I just want to shout y'all out, man, for rocking with us. Do me one favor for the week, all of our listeners. Unplug for one second of these dramatic programs. Just do me one favor. Just for a day or two. You know, unplug from these dramatic reels that constantly promote the war between uh, men and women. Unplug just for women and, and, and allow yourself some healthy dialogue. Allow yourself a healthy book. Allow yourself a healthy perspective because what we don't realize is that we are being programmed and that just continues the cycle. So please decide one day this week you're gonna unplug from all the madness, all right? God loves you and we do too. We are out of here, peace. Tim, if I have trouble, I'm going to call you. Let me do it like this.